Recording started. All right. Uh, today we are going to get into genetics um, more directly. We sort of talked about uh, genetic related things to some extent in our mitosis and meiosis discussion, but now we're getting right in there, right in the meat of it, the steak of it. Anyway. Uh, genetics, the study of how traits, physical characteristics are passed on from one generation to another. And uh, genes are the units of DNA, all chromosomes that control traits and offsprings. So genes are composed of units of polymers. So nitrogen base, sugar, um, deoxyribose in, in particular, or ribose. Just levels. Anyways, um, phosphoric acid and nucleotide. Genes are represented by two alleles, paired letters. So the capital letters represent dominant alleles, and then small letters are represented by or represent recessive alleles. Okay, now genes that have two of the same, so if I have two big ones or two little ones, that's called homozygous. Okay, now the genes have different alleles, so a big one with a little one. This is called heterozygous. Okay, now <clears throat> genotype versus phenotype. We want to sort of understand this. Uh, genotype is a representation of the genes. Okay, so whether they've got dominant um, alleles on there or recessive alleles. Now, dominant alleles are always capital letters. Okay, so if I have two capital letters, then that would be homozygous, dominant. Now, if I had two small or lowercase letters, then that would be a recessive, a homozygous recessive. Now, phenotype is different. Phenotype is the physical observable characteristics or trait that the gene makes or brings into existence. Okay, so if I have in, in P's, for example, Y, Y, okay, uh, two capital Y's, I would know, first of all, that this was a dominant pheno, uh, genotype, okay, and the phenotype that goes with it is yellow. Now, I know that a characteristic is dominant because in the heterozygous state, so if I have a big Y and a little Y together, of the heterozygous state, then the dominant phenotype is expressed, so yellow. Okay. Now, if I have dominant homozygous, then that's obviously going to be yellow. But if I, in order to get a recessive phenotype, I have to have a homozygous recessive characteristic. Okay. So that means in this case, uh, small y, small y. Now notice that the recessive phenotype in this case is green. So why do I put y's when I'm talking about green? Because uh, the alleles that are used to um, describe certain characteristics uh, go use the letters of the dominant characteristic. So if the dominant characteristic is green, then the, those would be g's instead of y's. But since um, the dominant characteristic is yellow, uh, you use Y's instead of G's. Okay, now we've talked about dominant versus recessive a little bit, but let's just nail this down. Dominant genes are always expressed to the first uh, filial generation. What does that mean? That means basically if I cross dominant characteristic with the recessive characteristic, um, the offspring that's the F1 generation. The first offspring will express the dominant phenotype. Now, the recessive genes will not be expressed in the F1 unless one gene is inherited from both parents. Okay. Now, any letter can be chosen to symbolize a trait or a gene. However, a key must be given. So, in this case, uh, we're talking about smooth and wrinkled seeds. Okay, so smooth is dominant to wrinkled, so we're using the S for the characteristic. So homozygous dominant will give us smooth seeds. Heterozygous will give us smooth seeds, but a homozygous 
uh, recessive will give us the wrinkled seeds. We don't see too many wrinkly peas, so yeah, I guess we know that's not dominant. Mendel loved his peas. What's wrong with Mendel? Doesn't he like cooked peas? <laughs> yeah, those guys are hilarious. Anyway, now who's Gregor Mendel? He's the known as the father of genetics. He was a science and math teacher and a monk that worked in Austria. Now in 1856, um, he gardening as a, a hobby, but he was interested in seeing what would happen if you crossed certain traits like yellow and green seeds, etc. So he wanted to find patterns in how traits were handed down. So prior to Mendel, scientists believed that one parent contributed the most to the F1 inherited features. However, Mendel brought the idea of blended inheritance. So he said that both parents contributed to the F1 or the first offspring generation trait. Okay, and that these are mixed and forever changed in the F1. Now, why did he use peas? Why didn't he use like cacti or something? Well, because um, they're easy to grow. They have a large number of offspring. They have a short growing season. They can self fertilize, which means they are, can be pure breeding plants. Um, and their anatomy makes them easy to cross fertilize. Because they can like just snip off the anthers or um, you know snip off the pistol and uh, you know stop any type of fertilization. And there's lots of genetic diversity in peas. So Self-fertilization, let's have a look at that. Self-fertilization is when the anthers, which is the male reproductive parts of a flower, um, fertilize the stigma or pistil, which is the female part of the plant, um, you know, directly. So the pollen goes on to the stigma, fertilizes the plant, and it produces the peas, the offspring. Now, cross fertilization means you take the pollen from one individual and you dust it onto the stigma of another individual. Okay, and in these cases, the anthers were removed previously so that it couldn't pollinate itself, and then you have a seed formation and a germination. All right, so continuing. Um, so we're talking about self-fertilization versus cross-fertilization. And uh, so the self-fertilization is asexual, and the pollen from the stamen fertilizes the ovules. And the male and female sex parts come from the same plant, and the F1 offspring will look identical to the P1 parent. And there's very little uh, variation. Now with cross-fertilization, the male and female sex cells come from different plants. The pollen from one plant is transferred to the pistil of another plant, and the F1 offspring do not look identical to the P1 plants, parents. Okay, they might look like one of them or the other of them, but they're not going to look identical to both of them. Okay, and there's a great variation in the F1. Now, advantages to Mendel's approach. Uh, he could obtain clear cut observable alternative forms of, of seven antagonistic traits. Okay, so purple versus white flowers, or yellow versus green peas, or round versus wrinkled peas. These are all either or traits, discrete traits. And there's no intermediate, uh, intermediate forms or continuous traits. And that's not, you know, true in all circumstances. Say, for example, as human beings, uh, there's lots of traits that are referred to as polygenic that have, um, you know, different degrees, uh, skin color would be one of those, eye color, hair color, things like that, where there's different shades. It's not either, you don't either have blonde hair or black hair, you know, there's lots of shades in between and other things. But here's uh, sort of a list of the seven antagonistic P pairs. So there was uh, pod color, pod shape, stem length, flower position, seed color, seed shape, flower color, all those types of things. 
Okay, now monohybrid cross results. Uh, monohybrid cross results are important because they tell you something about the genotype of the individual. All F1 from a monohybrid cross of true breeding seeds, so these are going to be homozygous seeds, doming or recessive, will resemble only one of the parents. Uh, why? Because there's only one type of genotype to be passed on. Okay. Um, well, if you're talking about, about true breeding seed. Now, if you're doing a, okay, a monohybrid cross where you have different individuals, though, it's always going to, because these are pure breeding individuals, one of them is going to be dominant over the other. In this case, smooth is, is dominant over wrinkled, so you end up with all smooth seeds. So that's one way to find out what is the dominant phenotype. Breed two um, true breeding seeds together. Now you will use what's known as punit squares to determine the, the genotype and subsequently the genotype of offspring. Okay, this is a chart used by genetics to show possible combinations of alleles in the offspring that predicts the genotypes and phenotypes. Okay. Now smooth and wrinkled. Um, here you can see how the genes are put together. And basically what you're doing is, is you're, you're taking possible gametes. So the parent one gametes could be, uh, you know, one dominant smooth allele or another one. And for the parent two gametes, they could only be recessive smooth alleles. So when you put them together, you end up with all heterozygous offspring, which will uh, demonstrate the dominant smooth phenotype. Okay, now once you start crossing together um, F1 and F1s, okay, so now we're putting together heterozygous versus heterozygous, you will get uh, different types of, of genotypes produced. Okay, you're going to get one quarter homozygous dominant, one half heterozygous dominant, and one quarter homozygous recessive. And the phenotypes will be three quarters of the P will be smooth, but you will get one quarter wrinkle. And you can determine these using your penis squares. Okay, so I put in my penis square here, and I put in one dominant, here's a dominant, and then I put a recessive, and a recessive, and that's going to give me dominant recessive. Well, actually, this one here will be, get rid of that. And here's going to be dominant. This one will be dominant recessive, dominant recessive, and this will be recessive recessive, two recessive homozygous. So, this one up in the corner, that's your homozygous dominant. These two are your heterozygous dominant, and this one is your homozygous recessive. So your appearance of hybrid offspring can have all sorts of different combinations. You know, you can end up with, um, you know, round seeds, green seeds, yellow um, seeds, flower colors in white, purple. You know, all sorts of variation is, is possible here. Now, Mendel's heredity laws. Um, Mendel's laws are as such. The first one is the law of discrete units of inheritance. So Mendel was one of the first guys who said there's something in the cell that transmits uh, characteristics, and he called them alleles. And the other one is the law principle of dominance, and he said that of these characteristics, there are recessive and dominant characteristics. And the last principle of heredity is the law of segregation. And he said that basically the traits or the genes of traits, hello Quinn, I guess people have been having trouble getting in. Okay. Oh, you got in. 
Probably with the link that I sent last time. Eh? Anyway, um, we were talking about Mendel's energy laws. Now, we probably have to go back and watch, uh, you know, the first part of the tutorial to catch everything, but you'll get some of the ideas here before then. So Mendel had um, these serenity laws, the discrete units of inheritance, which he called alleles. He said that in characteristics pairings, you can have dominant characteristics and recessive ones. And he said that those characteristics are passed on uh, in a you know random way, so to speak. Uh, there were no advantages of one gene or another as far as uh, the transmission to the next generation went. It was very mathematical, probab based on probability in Mendel's uh, model. Okay, so the discrete units of inheritance are the alleles, and some examples of the alleles would be for eye color, for skin color, height, hair texture, basically any discernible or definable characteristic you can say uh, Mendel would attribute alleles to it. Now most traits are determined by multiple genes with multiple alleles, but with the P's, um, they were more simple and therefore one pair of alleles would correspond with one discernible trait, which made it very good for discovering some of these laws of genetics, but wasn't realistic as far as, uh, you know, a lot of higher animals and stuff like that. <clears throat> now the principle of dominant, dominance basically says that one gene masks the effect of another gene. So if you had a, a round seed coat plant, which is dominant, crossed with uh, a wrinkled seed coat plant, uh, the wrinkled would not be expressed, in, you know, in the, the offspring, just around it. Okay, and the law of segregation, and this goes back to anaphase of meiosis one and the formation of gametes. Basically, so the two alleles for the given trait separate or segregate so that each gamete receives one or the other. The traits then unite in fertilization, one from each parent. So since those, those gametes, um, you know, are given one form of the gene or the other, uh, they have equal chance of being passed along. Now each parent carries two copies of the traits, and each offspring receives one allele from the parent in classical genetics. Anyway. Okay, and understanding genetics in this way can help us solve heredity problems and understand different principles of genetics. Now, the test cross is one of those things that is used. If I don't know, you know, a genotype or a phenotype, uh, what characteristics are dominant, what are recessive, okay, then you can do test cross. Now, the test cross is always performed between the unknown genotype where, okay, I don't know much about this individual, it's an unknown genotype, but let's say you do know what is recessive, so you can cross it with a recessive genotype. Okay, so uh, an example is if 50% of the first filial generation or the first offspring generation are black sheep, which is recessive, and 50% are white sheep, which is a dominant homozygous or heterozygous, uh, then what was the P1 generation? Okay, so you would do a test cross against the recessive genotype, okay, where I take the white sheep, which could be heterozygous or, he or homozygous, but I don't know if it's got two dominant alleles or if it has a dominant and recessive allele. I put them together. Okay, um, and see how it goes. Now, if I use a pn square, I can figure it out with the pn square because if I have two recessive individuals, that automatically means that I had to have a recessive gene in one of the parents. Because in order for the recessive phenotype to be expressed, it has to have two recessive alleles, one from each parent. 
Okay, so that's one way you can, can quickly solve those. Okay, so that's actually about it. Anyway, 